So welcome everybody. People are still trickling in, um, but I want to welcome you all to this uh, book Ada here at the Watson Institute in Providence, Rhode Island. And I, I know you're joining us from all over the world in different time zones. So thank you so much for joining us for this a very exciting uh, workshop that we're, we're uh, hosting today. My name is Patrick Heller. I'm a professor in the Department of Sociology, and I also have an appointment at the Watson Institute. Um, and on behalf of the Center for the Study of Contemporary South Asia and the director, Ashutosh Varshni, who I believe is uh, joining us, I'd like to welcome you all. And I wanna begin immediately by introducing our authors today and their book, and then I'll introduce the panel. And I just wanna to say to all the panelists and the authors that I'm gonna keep it very, very brief um, because we, we wanna give as much time uh, to, over to the conversation as possible. And I see that we are, have 70 plus participants. And I'll also say something briefly about how we hope people will participate in this event today. So today we are here to discuss the Dravidian model, interpreting the political economy of Tamil Nadu. This is a book that is in print already at Cambridge University Press. So um, it should be available to the public relatively soon. And I wanna begin by introducing the two uh, authors, beginning with Kalai Arastan A, who is an assistant professor at the Madras Institute of Development Studies. And selfishly, uh, more importantly for me right now is a visiting Fulbright Nehru uh, here at the Watson Institute in Providence, Rhode Island. Kalai ar arrived at the beginning of the year, just in time for the pandemic. So, um, but fortunately we, we've made Zoom work as effectively as possible. And, we, and we've, we've, the community here at Watson and at the center has been able to interact a lot with Kalai and we're really excited to be hosting this event. Uh, Kalai has written widely on, on political economy, on institutional change, on regional um, uh, politics, um, and is recently the co-author of an edited volume with Vijay Bhaskar on rethinking social justice. Um, Vijay Bhaskar, M. Vijay Bhaskar, is a professor at the Madras Institute of Development Studies. He's authored and co-edited over eight books on a, on a range of topics. Um, including, and I should note most recently, the Human Development Report of the State of Tamil Nadu, which figures very prominently in the book. Um, so uh, 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 Baskar and, and Kalai will be introducing their book uh, for 15 minutes, and then we'll turn to our panel. And I'm really excited to introduce our panel. When, when Kalai and I first discussed having this event, I, I asked Kalai for his, his wish list. Um, and in the age of Zoom, you know, you you can you can you you can sort of fantasize about um, um, really bringing together the best and most extraordinary people to comment on this book, and and the list that he gave me is the list of the panelists we have today because I I wrote to them and they very readily and quickly agreed to participate, and I think we're extremely lucky to have uh, Partha Chatterjee, Rina Agarwala, and Barbara Harris White with us today. Uh, Partha Chatterjee, as you all know, is a political theorist and a historian with uh, appointments both at Columbia in the Department of Anthropology and at the Center for St Studies and Social Sciences in Calcutta. Uh, Partha has written many, many books. Uh, I won't recite all of them, but I will mention I Am the Peep Reflections on Popular Politics Today, a very timely book which is out and figures prominently in the Dravidian model. Uh, likewise, uh, Rina Agarwala, and I have just lost my screen, sorry, um, is a professor of at John Hopkins University. She uh, does work on labor and social movements, on gender and informality. She is the author of Informal Labor, Formal Politics and Dignifying Discontent in India, uh, as well as the, the co-editor of What Class Reflections from South Asia. And, and, you know, Rena is also perfect for this panel. This is one of the cases in, in her book on informal labor is Tamil Nadu and figures uh, in the Dravidian model. And finally, anyone who works on Tamil Nadu or has followed the case of Tamil Nadu is familiar with the work of Barbara Harris. Uh, Barbara, unfortunately, cannot be with us for the whole panel. She'll be joining later in, uh, skipping out on a very important board meeting. Uh, to make her, her, her comments, but she will be with us. 
And so with no further ado, let me quickly say something about how, how I hope to proceed. I um, will begin with the introduction, move on to the panelists. I, I, the panelists have been uh, told that they have about 12 minutes each and we wanna try and be disciplined. If I give you the peace signal, it's not a peace signal, it's a two minute signal, you know, um, but I'm, I'm sure everyone's gonna be very self-disciplined and we won't, I won't need to be giving anybody peace signals. Uh, after uh, we've gone through the, 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 the panel commentators, I'll, say, I'll make some very brief closing comments and then invite the audience to participate. And we're gonna have two modes of participation given the large number, uh, we wanna give you two options. So option one is simply to enter your question in the chat room. So for all of those of you who are familiar with Zoom at the bottom of your right in the middle, you will find an icon for chat and you can write in a question and Grace Cardongo, who's an extraordinary coordinator to this event, monitor those comments um, and we'll try to synthesize them and, and have the authors respond. But we will also, time permitting, um, try to have some direct participation and the way we're gonna organize that, if, if you wanna speak, um, you are all automatically muted and only the powers that be can actually unmute you. Um, but if you raise your hand in the participant function, there's a raise hand um, uh, function um, that's available to you. We, we will take note of the order in which you raise hand, as I said, time permitting, uh, call upon you and unmute you and uh, allow you to ask a question. So. With no further ado, let me turn things over to Kalai and Baskar. And again, you know, thank you to all the participants. Thank you to the panelists, and especially a great thank, warm welcome to Kalai and Baskar. It's, it's really a privilege and an honor to have us today. A sincere thanks to everybody, particularly to Patrick, who has been a constant source of support and encouragement for making this event possible. And also for assembling this spectacular set of scholars as panelists. I grew up reading their works. We never thought that this is possible, even in our wildest imagination. We are humbled and honored. Often, human well being is defined by people's location, be it the poorer region in the world or groups one belongs within a region, whether they are low caste or Dalits or the people of color. Often, their efforts and the mobilization against their deprivation do not move beyond immediate questions of dignity. Hence, one sees persistent divergence in well-being across regions and across groups within region. Economics and political scientists therefore ask some important question in this regard. Why do some regions do well in growth, but not in development, while others do well in human development, but not in growth? And also, why does mobilization against status-based inequalities such as caste not always deliver development? When does such mobilization which for dignity delivers development along with representation in democracies. Our book argues that Tamil Nadu political and development trajectory offers some lessons to address this puzzle. We show that through caste-based mobilization and building solidarities across heterogeneous low caste groups, the state has been able to deliver on both growth and development. For instance, in India, if you take a states like Kerala and Himachal Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh for a large extent does well in uh, development, human development, but not correspondingly in growth. But on the other hand, if you look at Maharashtra and Gujarat, really does well in growth, but not in productive dynamism of the economy. So this divergence persists. So in Tamil Nadu case, a specific conception of social justice within the caste society, we, we argue is critical to this development trajectory. It made possible a move from politics of identity recognition to politics of development, which is redistribution, to an extent campaigning both for development. Such development is inseparable from questions of dignity because in the absence of adequate resources to avoid opportunities, mere grant of formal freedom to lower caste cannot ensure social justice. Freedom involves the power to act and the capacity to do things. This simultaneity of ensuring freedom and endowing the deprived with the material resources to act as substantially shaped development in the state. So we argue in the way that the combining growth and development 
and dignity and development is the the core argument of the book and we try to explain through this book with uh, through uh, uh, certain processes first to begin with the method we use a mixed method research design combining historical analysis that relies on archival material with secondary data and supported with field work to highlight the distinct trajectory of the state we provide data on various development parameters in relation to maharashtra and gujarat to a limited extent on kerala to explain these outcomes we have drawn upon conceptual tools from gramsci and laclo to explain the process of populist mobilizations and its electoral success at its institutionalization and the potential limit as stated earlier the success of tamil nadu lies in its ability to build a historical block of heterogeneous diverse subaltern caste groups to secure dignity and development social mobilization managed to force a tamil dravidian identity to build a gramshian national popular project to explain this process, success of this mobilization through laclo's concept of populist project as what of constructing a people which is having a diverse demands and we, from the heterogeneous mass of groups at a building a logic of equivalence among them against a sanskrit elite this is the uh, process in which the the political uh, populism constructed in the state and it institutionalized if non non electoral mobilization crystallized in building this historical block and also established a normative common sense through a critique of structures and ideologies that sustain caste inequalities and mobilization for electoral dividend as institutionalized as populism in the state this institutionalization in in turn led to a series of programmatic interventions that have undermined the prevailing relations of industries based on caste status therefore the institutionalizing this populism we divide into two component we call as a two strands of populist interventions that shaped the developmental trajectory in the state which we call as a social popular and the economic popular while both share certain common characteristic the domain of social popular constitute right based intervention ensuring increasing inclusive access to modern sectors and public goods it also has a definite redistributive content the social popular has a ref, definite redistributive content for instance affirmative action policies land reforms legislation for equal property rights some of these examples which fall under social popular and we also define another set of intervention which we call as economic popular are rooted in patronage and driven by electoral imperatives this is not uh, doesn't content doesn't have a redistributive content to it because it's driven by the immediate electoral cycles and they tend to address issues of absolute poverty for instance the expansion of put subsidies is a typical case will fall under this category having laid out this conceptual framework for understanding the processes at work we move on to highlight a few interventions across specific domains we began with uh, education and health care myron weiner is influential work makes the argument that the india's education policy has been historically biased towards elites favoring higher education at the expense of uh, mass education tamil nadu we suggest as a long history of countering this bias by a political and policy focus on primary education to begin with and also gradual shift in its emphasis towards higher education in the domain of higher education too we demonstrate how the state used affirmative action policies to broad base entry and simultaneously addresses the emerging differences within the intermediate caste and the dalits to democratize human capital formation this commitment to reversing the elite bias is also visible in the domain of health care constituting the first planning commission which is an act of federal assertion focusing on public health infrastructure generating socially inclusive health personnel innovative drug procurement have together contributed to building what we call as a robust public health care in a relative sense in the country we then turn our attention to the domain of capital now i invite my uh, co-author to give brief introduction or interventions in the domain of capital thank you kalai am i audible yeah stop okay thank you yeah uh, i would like to begin by joining kalai in thanking patrick and uh, the panelists for investing their time and effort for this event uh, so i am to extend uh, kalai's uh, uh, elaboration on what happened in the domains of health and education 
I uh, like to say something on how the process of capital accumulation in the state has been democratized to a greater extent. Contrary to popular perception that lower castes are mere recipients of welfare in the state, our analysis of the state's experience tells a different story. Tamil Nadu has a higher share of lower caste entrepreneurs compared to Maharashtra and Gujarat. In fact, one in four Dalit enterprises in the country is located in the state. So the question is, what made this possible? Uh, in the Dravidian imagination, there were two factors that hindered democratizing capital accumulation in the region. First, the ideologues held that the caste system rendered actors from some castes bond capitalists and those from others bond laborers. Second, the dominance of Marwari, red as North Indian capital in the region, was seen to prevent modernization of the economy and entry of Tamils into business. Diffusion of a productivist ethos, that is, those who toil should reap the benefits, unlike rontering by caste elites, and the belief that industrialization is critical to undermine social hierarchies, produced a broad-based political consensus for industrialization. C. N. Anadurai, founding member of the DMK, for instance, speaking in the Rajya Sabha 1962, invoked the southern question in Italy to seek economic advancement of the Tamil region. What is, however, interesting is the post-1990s phase when state actors recast themselves as facilitators of resource mobilization for growth. Importantly, the long-term investments in higher education translated into investments in capital accumulation among sections of lower caste during this phase. A simultaneity of growth and inclusive development was therefore established. M moving into the domain of labor, Kale, next slide, Kale. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, moving into the domain of labor, in Dravidian common sense, social justice was primarily imagined in terms of democratizing access to modern sectors and also move lower caste out of caste inscribed occupations. In line with this imperative, we established that investments in physical and social infrastructure have enabled rural labor to diversify away from agriculture much more than other regions. In parallel, welfare interventions and such as subsidized food through the public distribution system and caste mobilization have undermined hierarchical labor relations in the rural. The outcomes of Tamil Nadu's interventions in the domain of urban labor provides a solution to an interesting puzzle. A state which embraces economic reforms, including the key tenets of labor market flexibility, also does relatively better with regard to wages, wage shares, working conditions, and social protection for labor in both organized and unorganized sectors. We suggest that this is partly because unionization is more widespread in the region compared to other industry dynamic regions. More importantly, the embedding of labor mobilization within a larger subaltern identity that is able to draw a solidarity across different uh, laborers across different castes has also allowed them to bargain better with capital along with advances made in human capital formation in the state. And as Reena Agarwala has shown, when conventional collective bargaining strategies are weakening, welfare boards and other welfare interventions outside the domain of the outside have the issue of social protection to an extent here. We finally wrap up with a critical evaluation of the development experience and its implications for development politics in the global south. Though we argue that the state's political and development trajectory approximates what MOVE labels as left populism, we identify three broad constraints to its further expansion. One in the domain of federal relations, the second emerging due to limits of modernization, and the third internal to the logic of populist mobilization of a heterogeneous set of social groups. First, the extent to which rights-based interventions can be carried on within a subnational terrain is clearly limited by a pan-Indian political dispensation, and of course, not to mention the judiciary. Similarly, macroeconomic factors, the growing integration with global markets in particular, generate another set of constraints. In line with global trends, for example, the share, share of wages, despite being higher than other states, has been falling. Though levels of contractualization is lower, the need to attract investments likely to limit this process 
or for that matter, even the cost of producing affirmative action policies in the private sector. These are compounded by the limits posed by the logic of modernization itself. Despite having the larger share of its workforce in, man, uh, 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 in manufacturing, <clears throat> under certain economic dynamism, the state has not been able to increase the share of employment in manufacturing to the extent that one would desire. As the strategy suggests in a recent paper, even in early modern Europe, which has served as a template for building the theory of economic modernization, surplus populations that were dismembered from land could never be entirely transformed into necessary labor capital. This exhaustion of possibilities of the social popular within the logic of modernization, therefore, increases the domain of the economic popular. The logic of equivalence of demands across demands made by heterogeneous groups through a Tamil Dravidian identity is now weakened by the governmental logic of difference. Welfareist interventions are targeted at specific groups and are not always meant to transform the social relations that are generative relations to us. This may feed into unevenness across heterogeneous groups and generate new differences. Such factors, including the limits of the policies and uneven development within the state, have led to a range of disparities. Some are intra caste. Differences within caste are kind of widening. Many are inter caste. And inter caste, there are differences both between backward caste and Dalits, and also caste within this broad umbrella of backward caste or Dalits. Uh, this has in turn led to challenges to holding together of the Dravidian bloc. The extent to which populist mobilization can reorient to forge appropriate demands in the new context is likely to shape the possibilities of further expansion of democracy. Nonetheless, what this experience illustrates is that the question of dignity is inseparable from development for lower caste. With political labor, one can combine both dignity and labor if it can build horizontal solidarities across heterogeneous groups and articulate a more substantive way idea of social justice. Tamil Nadu's developmental experience can therefore well travel across India and the global south where status-based inequalities encounter modernizing growth. So I said stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kalai. Thank you very much, Baskar. That was a, a, a brilliant summary of a, of a very ambitious, big, comprehensive, detailed argument. Um, and for those who haven't yet read the book or seen the manuscript, I, I want to encourage them to do so when it comes out. Um, great. So, uh, Parto, are you there? Um, I want to hand things over to you as our first commentator. Yes. Thank you, Patrick. Mm -hmm. Should I start? Yes, please, Parto. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, I must first... Uh, Congratulate um, Kalai and uh, Baskar for uh, a truly remarkable book. Uh, is they've brought together um, a diverse set of material uh, and of course summarized a very large literature that has emerged on, on the development experience in, in Tamil Nadu and put it together in a very coherent, powerful uh, argument. Um, one might even say a kind of celebration of what they're calling uh, the Dravidian model. Uh, and uh, I think that it, this, this has a great deal of significance for um, future discussions on, uh, on the trajectories of development in different Indian states and whether or not uh, Tamil Nadu in fact holds out a, a, a certain uh, model for others to replicate. Now the question of models is <clears throat> interesting because uh, we've heard many, uh, models being proposed uh, in over the last several decades. We heard the Punjab Haryana model at the time of the Green Revolution. We had the West Bengal model based on progressive land reforms. We had the Kerala model, we had the Gujarat model. And now um, we now have presented a Dravidian model, uh, which actually uh, claims uh, a, the possibility of being emulated in other places. And we'll come back to this. But on that question, let me begin by first pointing out <clears throat> uh, something that uh, uh, Kalai and uh, Bhaskar basically assume, which is the distinction between the national and the subnational. Now, they haven't gone into detailed discussion as to what this actually implies, uh, 
But clearly there are, it seems to me, there are two sort of dimensions there which, which are assumed. One is the question of the size of an economy where, for instance, it's in large economies such as, let's say, India or Brazil or China, maybe, maybe US, maybe even Europe, if you take, to get, take, to take it together, uh, where the size of the economy suggests that there will be significant regional differences and therefore very significant directions that particular regions may take, even within the framework of the legal constitutional framework of a single national economy. So that's the one dimension. But I think the most significant dimension that they suggest is whether or not there is a kind of optimal size of an economy which can connect the uh, borders of an economy or at least the, the policy borders of an economy with a certain cultural formation. Uh, and that is a very crucial part of their argument where they're suggesting that in fact, development uh, strategies that have a foundation in a certain cultural movement uh, has a far greater possibility of producing democratic outcomes. Uh, and that's, that I think is a particularly interesting part of their argument, which we need to think through a little bit more because that I think has a great deal of bearing on uh, the extent to which the Dravidian model might be replicated in other places. So let me just quickly um, move to uh, what their main claims are. They are saying, claiming that populist mobilization, so unlike the usual uh, sort of uh, dismissal of populism as some kind of uh, perversion or corruption, um, they are in fact suggesting that populist mobilization uh, as the political foundation of, develop, of, a demo, of development actually has the possibility of producing better outcomes. Uh, and there are two basic claims that they are making uh, on behalf of the Dravidian model. First, that when national policies have an elite bias, uh, the, uh, the uh, populism, that's subnational populism, can produce better outcomes uh, for marginal populations. That's the first claim. And the second is that a focus on reducing status-based inequality rather than asset-based inequality actually has a better chance of this, uh, this outcome. Uh, and now these are two quite strong claims uh, because what they're suggesting is that instead of the kind of universalist sort of welfare schemes, which one initially in the 1950s and so on was understood as the basic social democratic form of the welfare state in, in, in Europe, for instance. So health facilities were universally available, access to education universally available, um, you know, uh, the guarantee of livelihood, uh, a minimum income universally available as part of the rights of citizens. Now, in the Indian case, the understanding always was, yes, in theory, that should be the, the, the objective. But of course, the state does not have the resources at the moment. But in it, so that you will find many of these claims, you know, for instance, in the directive principles of the, of the constitution, they're there. But of course, the idea is that as we go along, then the state develops um, better foundations of resources, we will extend this to the general population. The claim now is the populist mobilization actually starts from the other side to say, no, everyone does not have an entitlement. And there is this whole argument about an internal border which identifies a, 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 a mass of people, right? Who may be disparate in their specific interests and locations, but are all said to be the victims of exploitation or oppression by an elite that is identified. There is an internal border which is created. And this is what they uh, go into. Uh, now this, this story is quite well known in the case of Tamil Nadu, the entire cultural movement of Dravidianism uh, through the Justice Party and the self-respect movement and the DK and then DMK, ADMK onwards, it's almost a uh, hundred years now. Uh, and this foundation of Dravidianism posed against Brahminism and the connections that are drawn between 
let's say, Dravidianism, Tamil uh, on the one side, and Brahminism and the All Indian Brahminical Foundation uh, with a cultural foundation in Sanskrit and Hindi. That opposition, that's the entire story that's gone on. And what is being claimed in this book is that this tradition actually uh, has entered, it's no longer a matter of partisan politics in, in Tamil Nadu anymore. It is, as it were, general common sense that this, this is the way it is. So that because of this, in fact, uh, the, uh, what, what the strategy, the development strategy that they describe is essentially, and this is interesting because they, uh, in the end, they talk of this as a left populism and we can uh, ask to what extent is it proper to describe this as left at all? Because on the one hand, the argument is that unlike, let's say, the classic sort of communist traditions, which would say, uh, which would not accept the idea that capital accumulation should be facilitated. In fact, here the whole argument is capital accumulation, let it be facilitated. And instead of pursuing, uh, uh, you know, uh, programs such as land reforms and so on, let us ensure access to education on a wide scale and attack uh, the instituted institutionalized inequalities based upon uh, status. So essentially caste, right? That is what is attacked. And the argument and the claim is that, yes, this does not stop inequalities in the economy from emerging because there will still be dispossession. Where, you know, people would lose land as it's happening. There will, people will move from agriculture to the cities. And, and in the cities, they will not all be absorbed in, in you know, good jobs and manufacturing industries and so on. So there will be a huge informal sector. But the argument is that outside the workplace, there can be enough protections offered by properly designed uh, state initiated programs, which will offer protection to these people and they will provide them with some opportunity for improving their lives. That's the basic claim that is being made. So it is in fact a, a, an argument that uh, unlike let's say the, the West Bengal kind or Kerala model of, of you know, uh, uh, land reforms first, attack the, uh, the economic structure of production and then think of other uh, possibilities. This is arguing in a very different direction. Now, the interesting question that I have is what are the limits to, to, to this model? And to what extent is this replicable elsewhere? Um, there is a whole discussion at the end of the book on the limits. Uh, and of the limits, they, they, they are mark out certain possibilities, certain difficulties that have been encountered in this. I think the, the more interesting uh, and difficult problem is this. One, the development of internal divisions within this block this so-called popular book. That is well known, it is, it's, it's been, it's noted in the book, but for instance, divisions along caste lines, there's a whole uh, critique <coughs> of, <coughs> among Dalit movements that the uh, advantages have been largely cornered by, you know, relatively prosperous uh, backward castes. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, and politically, there are several fragmentations within the Dalit, within the Dravidian movement. So one of the things, one of the important ones, it's not considered at all. What was the significance of the split between the DMK and the ADMK? Because one of the crucial things that clearly happened was that once the AIA DMK was formed, the whole rationalist critique of religion and culture and so on was largely given up. Uh, and yet, and that enabled electoral uh, success of the AIA DMK. And now those kinds of questions are not brought into the picture. And my final comment therefore is uh, that is the Dravidian model which is now being celebrated in the case of Tamil Nadu, is, is there a question of, a, of, a, of the exhaustion of the cultural experiment itself? In, uh, in other words, can the Dravidian uh, identity actually continue as a viable uh, framework 
for development on, in the future. On the other hand, the question of to what extent this is replicable elsewhere raises the whole question of, of the future of federalism in India, I think, because lots of uh, recent uh, incidents which, which, was, which would suggest that, uh, that the, the, the attempt to centralize, uh, which clearly the present uh, regime in, in Delhi has been trying to follow, uh, is being resisted in, in different states. Uh, we saw this with the, with the whole GST question, for instance, or in fact, with the whole management of the, of the uh, COVID pandemic. So there are lots of instances where this is, this is emerging, and yet there is no coherent uh, foundation for any kind of distinct uh, political or economic or developmental model emerging in other states. And I think this suggests a very interesting general, you might say theoretical argument, which is to say that, that uh, development uh, models are necessarily appropriate, must be appropriately designed for particular regions because the, the requirements and conditions uh, in different regions are not the same. And second, that the a foundation that, uh, that uh, of, for, for a development strategy that relies on a cultural embeddedness in, in, in a movement, a cultural movement, which necessarily is strongly uh, dependent on questions of language and other kinds of historical memory, uh, whether or not, in fact, the regional uh, cultural uh, you know, frameworks are more appropriate. And that would be what the Dravidian model might suggest uh, for the rest of India. But I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Parto. That was excellent and, and right on time. So thank you very much for those wonderful comments. Um, Rina, can you hear me? Are you ready? Yes. On to Rina Agarwala. Thank you, Rina. Okay. Well, thank you, Patrick, for organizing this. Thank you, Partha, for your comments. Um, they overlap somewhat with mine, so that makes my job easier. And I, too, am really humbled and honored to be a part of this panel. Um, this is exciting. And so I have to first start by thanking Galai and Basker for writing this book at last. Um, I 100% agree with your starting motivation for the book. There is this really odd gap in our literature on subnational states. We have the book on Kerala by Patrick Heller. We know about Gujarat. We know about West Bengal. We even know about Bihar, but we really just don't have that definitive book on Tamil Nadu. And yet Tamil Nadu keeps emerging as this sort of top winner in so many different areas of development. And for me too, when I was studying informal workers in India, movements in India, Tamil Nadu just sort of fell into my life completely for empirical reasons. There really was no theoretically motivated reason for me to start with Tamil Nadu. Um, there wasn't a Tamil Nadu model that I was sort of starting to follow. It was just that once I was in the field, it basically became impossible to ignore the successes that were being talked about coming from Tamil Nadu. Um, it wasn't noted as much in the academic literature, but it was clear that Tamil Nadu was a pioneer in informal workers' movements. It, had, it was also the state that had experienced the most material successes in implementing welfare um, for informal workers. And as soon as I arrived, it became in Tamil Nadu, it became clear to me that there is something unique about Tamil Nadu's um, method or approach to development um, and why they're uh, sort of attaining these development achievements, not just among informal workers, but as you so nicely show in the book across so many different areas of development. Um, so the dearth of manuscript level attention to, to Tamil Nadu is odd and again, I really thank you for bringing us this book. You've done an enormous service by covering such an incredible breadth. I mean, it really, it covers every topic, um, you know, from education, healthcare, economy, food distribution, rural housing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You reference almost everyone um, and engage almost every argument. And you provide a real dizzying amount of statistics um, that I hope will provide a reference for all of us. So I think there's no doubt the book will become extremely useful as a starting point on what I hope will be much more attention to the particular 
and unique development trajectory of Tamil Nadu. So I wanna just sort of focus my comments on four questions that all stem from the title of the book, which is the Dravidian model. And my instinct is to very much agree that there is something called the Dravidian model. But by the end of the book, I wasn't entirely clear what exactly it is and what comprises this Dravidian model and which parts of it are most interesting to you. And part of it is, part of um, my questions emerge, I think, because um, you toggle between two, what I think are very different aspects of the model. Um, one comes from above and one comes from below. So I wanna just sort of dig deeper into these two sides of the model as I, as I understood the book. So on one hand, you give a lot of credit to the state project from above, which in Tamil Nadu is, as we know, this unique form of what you call left populism. You often note that certain ideas came from the leaders of the populist state from above, um, including welfare boards. You note that state officials are particularly creative and constantly refining and reinventing caste-based reservations. You say the state was particularly efficient in delivery of public health care and infrastructure. They did a much better job than other states of implementing national policies like NREGA. Um, and they were especially responsible, responsive, sorry, to citizen demands. And here, as I also read, I agree with you that Tamil Nadu's populism is a, a different variety than the populism we hear so much negative press about in the US and Europe and to some extent, Latin America. Tamil Nadu's populism has resulted in a more inclusive expansion of material and symbolic gains for marginalized populations. But at times you paint such a beautiful picture of a Tamil Nadu's populism that I was left wondering what is really populist about it at all in your mind. Um, I think it, you make a very clear case of how it differs from communism as you say, you know, it of course does not try, try or even succeed in att uh, attacking capitalism per se. But I was at times wondering how you distinguish it from social democracies. Um, there you have a line in there in the start that says it is different, but I wasn't quite sure exactly how. And I would argue that one major difference between Tamil Nadu's po left populism and other left parties of the social democratic variety is that Tamil Nadu's populism, like all populisms, promised to alleviate the wrongs done to this plebeian mass without changing the structures that caused those wrongs in the first place, um, without changing the structures that form the inequities and marginalizations in the first place. Uh, and although you don't talk about this as much, there is this history of DMK, which was very repressive on labor movements, um, under Karunanidhi and, and perhaps this would be what explains the limits to the model uh, that you detailed at the end with intercaste divisions erupting due to privatization, et cetera. So I wanna form that as a question. That was sort of at least my understanding of what distinguishes populism, even left populism from social democracies. But I'm curious to hear your take on what is what makes it populist at all. And second, I wanted to understand more about what mechanisms you really feel that Tamil Nadu's populism works through. In other words, why would populist leaders, even left populist leaders, bother to increase these freedoms and caste-based inequities? And again, I would have argued that the main mechanism through which populism delivers is the desire for electoral votes and populist leaders' ability to define this broad population of an aggrieved people. But at the end of the book, you argue, it seems to me that populists like DMK haven't actually been that successful electorally. Um, I, I also, a small question was, it seemed to me that you implied that ADMK is not populist, which I didn't understand as much, but um, at least in my reading, I took them as, as both DMK and ADMK is very populist and important what was important to their uh, delivery was the competitive populism or the competition between these two parties that really empowered voters to draw party attention. But again, 
I, it seemed to me that you were downplaying the electoral mechanism, and I believe that falls under what you call economic popular. And instead, it seems to me that you're arguing that the main mechanism through which Tamil Nadu's populism is able to deliver these, um, these development achievements is that it works through a form of representative identity politics where state leaders actually come from so many different castes themselves that they are more attuned to and willing to meet the demands and the needs of different groups. And if that's the case, then again, I return to the question of what then makes populism different in this case, not from a social democracy, but in different from a representative identity type politics. So my second set of questions goes down to the other side of the Dravidian model, which is the movement from below. And that is, of course, the Tamil Dravidian social mobilization movement. And here you offer a nice history of the movement and its ability to mobilize a particular status identity, which in turn helps foreground these demands for social justice. Um, but I was left wondering again, what aspect of this status-based movement is most important to Tamil Nadu's development achievements. On one hand, I thought maybe you're, are you making an argument that it sometimes seemed to me very similar to Prerna Singh's argument about this solidaristic tie or the identity that is um, so crucial to attaining consent for cross-class assistance and a reduction of inequities across classes. Um, you mentioned that self-respect and shared experience was so key to Perrier more than self-rule. So is it the solidaristic tie that makes the Dravidian movement, the social movement, so important for ultimate development gains? Or are you arguing that status uh, mobilization is a more strategically powerful and effective mass mobilizational tool than a class-based um, movement? I, I wasn't, that brings me to another question, which I wasn't quite sure what your um, in understanding or argument is about caste versus class or status-based mobilization versus class-based. Sometimes there's a hint of a little bit of a horse race that caste is more important than class or caste is more effective than class. You mentioned access to opportunity and administration and modern, modern education is more critical than land reform, again, you know, on what basis. And you mentioned that the power of social welfare entitlements outside employment, which Partha also talked about, is, is very, very important. But again, at least I, I'm trying to make the argument that just because there are social welfare entitlements outside employment does not mean that it is a non-class-based uh, movement. It can still be a class-based movement that brings welfare entitlements outside the workplace. Um, and then finally, what's coming to Gramsci, what civil society organizations really help transmit this Dravidian common sense that you talk about? Was, did it get transmitted through the schools? I mean, this was a constructed identity, as you nicely point out. It's, it sort of builds together a mega caste identity, but how was it transmitted? And this comes to a little bit about this ending question, which is, then we can talk about sustainability, but at the start, was it transmitted through schools, media? What was the mechanism or the civil society institution? So coming back to the Dravidian model, um, which of these is more central to the Dravidian model? Is it the populism? Is it that Dravidian movement from below? Is it the particular interaction or does one need both? And that brings me to my sort of last set of questions, which is, I, I, again, something that Partha also mentioned, which is, of course, implicit in the title of the, uh, is that Tamil Nadu offers a development trajectory that can actually be modeled or should be modeled and should be imitated. And the question, of course, is can it be replicated and should it be replicated? Um, I want to hear from you what your thoughts are. In addition to the, um, populism from above and the mega caste identity movement from below. I remember I was once speaking to a colleague about my own findings in Tamil Nadu and I was asking him why I never managed to get much traction 
on my argument about competitive populism in Tamil Nadu. And he, you know, people were, were sort of very willing to accept that informal workers' movements were successful in Tamil Nadu, but they were really resistant to um, credit populism for that success. And he just sort of laughed in my face and said, that's just far too controversial to celebrate. Um, no one's gonna celebrate populism. Um, there, and, and that got me thinking that perhaps that's why we don't have until now that definitive book on Tamil Nadu. Um, so I wanna hear, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how, if at all, the Dravidian model can be replicated and relatedly, whether you think people would be willing to engage populism as a potential pathway to democratic expansion, if that's even what you're trying to argue. Thank you again for the book though. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Rena, for that comments. Um, I see that Barbara uh, Harris, was, Barbara, I introduced you before, before you joined us. So with no further introductions, um, um, if you could unmute yourself and, and, and give us your comments. And thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yeah. Right. I first visited Tamil Nadu in late 1972, and I last visited it in late 2019. And throughout, I've been seeking to understand development through fieldwork in Tamil Nadu. And I guess it's because of that that I have the privilege of participating in this panel. I'm very grateful to have been invited, and I'm even more grateful to Kale and to Basker for creating this book. I am also quite frankly, intimidated because the audience I know is much more learned about Tamil Nadu than I am. I've read the book, but like Rina, my comments are probably going to be confined to inspirations from the title. But first, Tamil Nadu is now in the average of middle income states worldwide. And it doesn't go without saying that this is a massive achievement. And the book on Tamil Nadu is an original approach, not just to this achievement, but to the interpretation of political economy of development, as it says in its subtitle. And the book is inspired by a range of wide, um, widely scoping intellectuals by Gramsci, by Periyar, and by Pandian. And its central question is how does political culture affect economic and social development. And so this is a culturalist account of material and social development. And as Partha explained, through political labor, a Dravidian and Tamil historical bloc was formed across all non-Rantia and non-Brahmin castes, forming um, what Kale and Baska have described as a Dravidian common sense a common sense identity with a productivist and a social reformist ethos. So what we learn from the book is that ideological hegemony can gen generate material uplift and dignity, and that interventions for social justice can aid accumulation, and that structural change is the product of lower cost accumulation. Capital labor struggle as a motor of the economy is quite deliberately denied in favor of an explanation in terms of the Dravidian alliance. It deserves extreme praise for pulling off a justification for this thesis, also for stretching the analytical framework of development economics to encompass culture and politics, and for the original and broad conception of health, which even extends to girls' literacy and marriage ages, um, a great broad concept of social well-being, perhaps missing waste and sanitation. One of the big minuses has been pressed on me um, today by spending the morning in Terry, up in Delhi, um, arguing about the fact that economic development is physically unsustainable and that the Dravidian model, like all the models, is unreplicable and entirely new models of development are needed.
In this book, the ecological nightmare doesn't appear until page 240 in the version that I read. <clears throat> and it's clear that what we need for the future is development conceived in terms of, sorry, <clears throat> in terms of energy and materials and biodiversity. And that given that there's a huge gap between the India that appears in global models and the India that appears in national models of energy transition and climate change, there's a huge project of work to do there and development studies in which Kale and Baska are exponents uh, can make a huge contribution by linking um, the material and the energy models with politics and with society. So I wanted to start by calling for radically new projects and approaches in the study of development. Otherwise, my comments are going to echo those of Parta and of Rina, and perhaps just my take from political economy. Firstly, populism. Kale and Baska's take on populism gen generates many interesting questions. As both the previous commentators have, have emphasized, uh, their take is that radical populism is progressive in developmental terms. It has radical democratic potential. In the early 80s, um, an engineer in the field in Coimbatore called it our socialism. And the argument is that social safety nets permit the persistence of petty forms of production like the subsistence engineer, and they generate economic growth by multiplication as well as by accumulation. So uh, yes to capitalism, but radical populism enables it to um, somehow to cushion the victims of this process and to shape it in a particular form. In the book, um, I probably differ a little bit with Rina because I think clear distinctions have been made by our friends between social populism, rights-based, socially horizontal, equity-centered, um, and long-term in its vision, that on the one hand, and economic populism on the other, which is patronage-based, state-based, tending to appease um, potential voters and short-term. And I think they argue very convincingly, having distinguished them, that both are left progressive. However, in the body of the book, I found it wasn't always clear which achievements are social populist and which are economic populist and how they relate in terms of party politics and how they are sequenced. So I think there's work to be done there um, to, de to develop these themes. Towards the end of the book, we get social left and political left, which need to come earlier and be sewn into the narratives of radical populism. The social populist also becomes the social popular and the economic populist, the economic popular. And I wonder if this is deliberate and what the difference between populist and popular um, consists of throughout the book. Um, trade unions at one point are said to replace left parties in Tamil Nadu, but the point about the Dravidian model is that it's a left progressive kind of populism. And because the Dravidian model has to transcend party politics, the Dravidian movement is invoked all the way through. So political labor is an important concept, but there are real gaps in the book um, concerning the history and the political competition between the two plus Dravidian parties. Um, and what we derive as readers is that the two parties are di dismissed, or the three parties, dis are dismissed as less significant than the underlying Dravidian mobilization. And I wonder how we can know that from the evidence in the book. Um, I will skip over what I was going to say about caste because uh, the other two commentators have more or less encapsulated what I wanted to say. I want to turn to the idea of the Dravidian, and here I have some questions which are born out of ignorance. Dravidian is a language group with 245 million people. By the end of the 19th century, Telugu, as well as Tamil Brahmins, had all the privileges. They had land holdings, they stacked the professions, they captured government jobs and political positions, especially village Munsif. And so what the book explains is the way in which 
in the 20th century, the Justice Party emerges um, to challenge this hegemony. A self-respect movement is championed by Periyar, anti-caste, anti-patriarchy. And later on, there's a movement of Dravidian nationalism. So there are several strains of Dravidian politics. Um, clearly, there isn't any support for Dravidian nationalism outside Tamanad, but the book doesn't handle the process in which the idea of the Dravidian becomes captured by Tamils or Tamilianized or rejected by other Dravidian language groups. There's a passing reference to Dravidi Dravidian Telugu splinters in this book. And my question is, why was there no enduring support for Dravidianism in its several manifestations in Kerala and in Andhra? Um, the watershed moment of independence was given little attention in the book and clearly that's deliberate and independence was not a watershed moment for Madras. Was it the politics of linguistic states that came about in 1956 that Tamilized the Dravidian movement? What is the importance of language in economic and social development? These are really big questions which the audience may know the answers to, but I don't. I want to ask some questions about the idea of a model, because the model is also in the title. The concept of model is not defined in the book, and it appears not just as a set of representations of a complex reality leading to determinate transformations, which is the sort of model that I'm dealing with with climate modelers and food systems modelers. It's not that kind of a model, nor is it just an example. Um, it seems to be a subnational state to emulate, and both other commentators have picked this up. And Baska said just now, experience which can travel. If this is a model, why could it not be replicated in other Dravidian states? Kale and Baska argue that the model might be replaced by a concept of political regime. And indeed, if you um, search for political regime, you will find that this concept is used interchangeably with model through the book. And I think it's mentioned much more than model in the text, if not in the running head headings. So I would like to ask the authors what the relative statuses are of political regime and of model. The model is virtuous. Um, and yet, Tamil Nadu, ever since I started to work there, has been famous for corruption. Pork barrel politics from Jeranjan is mentioned just in passing and not developed and not developed at all in the book. So I want to ask, how can the Dravidian model coexist with such degrees of corruption and crime? Because the story of robustness and resilience and the continuities of the Dravidian model include the continuities of crime. How did the model cope with its enemies? At the very end of the book, the Dravidian block is an expanding coalition of interests, at the top of which low caste elites are said to reject the Dr Dravidian model. They prefer the activism of the market. They prefer consumption. The book ends on a completely fascinating cliff edge. And the past tense is used for the Dravidian model at the very end. So my question is, to what has the Dravidian model ceded? And if it has ceded, that generates a load of questions about replicability. Um, I want to uh, talk about something which may seem controversial to the writers of the book because of its absence. I'm going to argue that the uniqueness of Tamil Nadu is not that there has been no work on the regional economy, as the authors assert, but that so much work was done on Tamil Nadu so early, much before the Kerala model or the Gujarat model or any other state model. Baker and Washbrook, for instance, are just summarily dismissed for their concern for factional politics rather than horizontal mobilization. Malcolm Adisatia's labor of love is only mentioned in passing in his contribution to the first state perspective plan. Effectively, his huge labor all his life, um, once he returned to Madras, is effectively unmentioned. 
there is the tiniest invocation to MIDS scholarship on Tamil Nadu. Four fifths of the MIDS references in this draft that I read are the word amidst rather than MIDS. So conspicuous by their absence, even to criticize and to dismiss are other attempts at regional political economy. Um, when MIDS was formed, its first director was C.T. Korean, who came from Madras Christian College, where with Joe James, they had spent many years um, developing a regional and functional, what they called a pre-theoretical disaggregation of the Tamanad economy. They stressed factors like urbanization, small-scale production, distinctive industrial clusters. They located the genesis of Tamil Nadu's structural transformation in the 50s to the early 70s in factors which have been mainstreamed in other regional analyses like technology, irrigation, um, and the spread of poverty through real wage stagnation. Um, in other words, I suppose the main point I'm trying to make is that to press the political and cultural interpretation, other interpretations are not um, need to be eliminated, and they're not eliminated in the book. The agrarian question is ignored, the perverse transformation due to no space for exit for settlement is ignored, the informal economy is not really given the paramountcy it deserves, the high rate of urbanization and density of towns is certainly mentioned, but the parasitic forms of accumulation that may go on in those towns doesn't get attention. The last point I want to make is about regional economics and, and states or regional stories of development and states. Because it occurs to me that the moment that you map district level data, you have a problem both for the explanatory power of models and for the idea of the state as a container both for data and for a focus on policy as a major factor which explains performance. Indian states are very rarely regions and they're certainly not agroecological zones. And this was all exposed 20 years ago by Kunal Sen and Richard Palmer Jones. Um, so I want to finish my comments being as efficient as I possibly can and bringing up just a few maps to explain what I mean. Okay, can I share? No, I can't share, wait a moment. Share screen. Grace, is it possible for oh, Barbara to share? Up. And, and think... Barbara, we, 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 we should move on too. So I, I, I hope this will be- um, This will be very quick and it's my last point. Yeah. Thank you. Can you see? Yes, we can, can choose. Can you see I the maps? See. So can everybody watching look at Tamil Nadu on these maps? Here's a map of land rent. It doesn't coincide with Tamil Nadu at all. However, there's an Eastern literal track of poverty running up the whole of the Eastern side of India. Here's agricultural labor. Um, it does indicate Tamil Nadu, but Tamil Nadu is part of a much bigger region where the ratio of labor to total um, uh, agrarian population is very high. Here, by contrast, are maps of the commercialization of agriculture. First, Tamil Nadu doesn't exist as a region. And secondly, the region has changed radically from um, uh, east to west. Here are the industrial regions. They are also very patchy all over India. Here are a set of maps. Don't boggle, just look at the south. These are maps of Dalit participation in the economy, in different sectors of the economy. Tamil Nadu is, is strikingly low in terms of Dalit participation in poverty. There's a Dalit story about poverty um, and it's a South Indian story about poverty and nobody has ever told it. And lastly, here's an, a, an example of welfare, stunting. Again, Tamil Nadu is very patchy. So I'm going to, whoops. <laughs> I'm, I shall stop that just by saying, uh, uh, there's a regional poverty belt. Um, why and how come 
what is the poverty of rural income grounding in? Why did political mo mobilization fail in uh, some areas of Tamil Nadu and not others? Is it the impact of the distribution of lower costs? I don't know. And lastly, comparative development. Yes, Maharashtra and Gujarat are good comparators, but what about the other Dravidian states? I've got comments on handling of capitalism and on the state, but I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. So uh, we've had a superb uh, set of comments from three panelists. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, and I'm going to keep uh, um, Baskar and Kalai had asked me to also comment, um, but I'm going to keep my comments really, really short because I want to make sure we have time to um, to discuss. Sorry. Um, and I I. I want to pick up on this discussion of model, and one you know one of the one of the problems with models is um, it, it it goes to this question of replicability, et cetera, and it's been framed in the conversation largely within the Indian context. And I want to go comparative, and I want to suggest that this isn't so much a model as a trajectory, and we can debate the labels left populism, social democratic, et cetera. But I think it's a trajectory that's not actually all that uncommon. Um, I, I wrote a book with colleagues years ago on social democracies in, in, the, in the global south. And we looked at a number of cases, in, including Kerala. Um, with the one case we didn't discuss uh, that I wish we had is Brazil. And I want to highlight what I think are, you know, everyone's commented on how comprehensive, how thorough, how rich this analysis is, how compelling the argument is and the three uh, panelists have raised some interesting questions. I, I, I wanna just highlight large theoretical claims that I think have significance well beyond the case of Tamil Nadu um, and well beyond the case of India and draw the parallels with Brazil um, because I think the parallels are actually stunning. So point one, um, I think this book explodes the old argument about the trade-offs between welfare and growth. And this is a familiar right-wing argument, right? You, you can't have growth and welfare at the same time, but the left indulges in this argument as well. For a long time, it was argued Kerala would never grow because it over-invested in welfare. What this broke brilliantly shows is that welfare and expanding social capabilities you know, which is uh, the sort of hegemonic language these days of talking about development, um, does indeed um, um, uh, 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 lay, the, lay the, the, the groundwork for more inclusive and dynamic forms of growth. So th that, that's critically important. And the parallel with Brazil is that a lot of the extraordinary reform took place in Brazil uh, from the 80s uh, forward, you know, until the current moment, which is deeply problematic, much as it is in India, uh, those reforms were largely social welfare reforms, expanding health care and access to education, et cetera, without any land reform per se. And they had similar effects. They directly attacked the very hierarchical status-based nature of Brazilian society, which is race-based, um, uh, but also paved the way for a much more inclusive model of growth. Um, so there's a, a really interesting parallel there. The second point is a point that Parto started with and you know, for a sociologist, this is this is uh, golden to our ears. Um, that what drives economic uh, and social development is this kind of uh, cultural ideological revolution, right? And you know, it's it, it's kind of an old Marxist argument, right? In order to get progress and modernity and more dynamic growth, you have to remove the social fetters of the pre-capitalist system or the pre-capitalist system of status identities, and and that's what the the Dravidian. Uh, and the, the Dravidian common sense does. Uh, and, and I just wanna highlight a point that is made in the book, but it's not theorized, is that this, this movement from below, this cultural ideological revolution, it, it feeds the, the welfare programs, it, it, it feeds the path of democratic uh, economic inclusion, but it, it also comes to state building. It, it makes the state much more accountable, much more responsive, much more high capacity uh, 
than is the norm in India. And again, the parallel with Brazil is really striking where movements from below have really strengthened the capacities of different Brazilian agencies to actually uh, uh, develop, uh, deliver. Um, the third argument, and you know, Prana Singh has made this argument, but it's so rarely made in political science in particular. And in this day and age of you know, pandemics and Brexit and, and ethno-nationalism and right-wing populism, we sort of forget that it's still possible to build solidarity. Um, and you know, par part of the challenge on the left has been getting beyond the working class solidarity narrative, right? That, that all our, you know, beginning with Marx and then through the literature on the European social democratic state, it's always assumed that any possibility for a more inclusive democratic form of capitalism is predicated on strong solidaristic working class. Well, you know, live in the era of deindustrialization. So waiting for the working class is a bit like waiting for Godot these days. And instead, um, you guys, you know, as, 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 as Chantal Mouffe has argued, you know, recognize that solid, there's other bases to solidarity other than just the homogeneity of structural position, et cetera. And, and I think, and again, Brazil is really striking that way. I mean, the PT, yeah, it's a workers party, but the PT was built on the strength of an incredibly diverse, vibrant social movement sector that brought together anti-racists, that brought together um, the base communities of liberation, the liberation theology, Catholic Church, very much had a cultural ideological um, um, uh, he hegemony uh, of, of, of discourses having to do the preferential treatment of the poor, um, et cetera. And so again, you know, we, we need new ways of thinking about the nature of the kind of horizontal solidarities that you talk about. And then the, the fourth very quick point I wanted to make um, is that I, I think the distinction you draw between economic and social populism is, is a really powerful distinction that, you know, the, the two exist in parallel. They're, they're very different. As, as Barbara said, they can both be part of a left progressive politics. Uh, but, you know, one is, as you guys argue, uh, more short term and, and driven by electoral cycles and, and a form of control and governmentality. The other strengthens uh, horizontal solidarity. But we, we need to recognize that it's never all or nothing, that these things do go together. Um, the, the, the big question I want to pose to you <clears throat> is, do you, is it, you know, the, the distinction you draw between st status hierarchy versus class, and, and Rena commented on this on, uh, as well, is, is it really such a clear distinction? Uh, because I, I think you had in mind uh, Kerala, among other things, and yeah, sure, Kerala did land reform, but, you know, from Purna Singh's argument to some of the things I've argued myself, I, 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 a lot of reforms in Kerala were driven by the politics of recognition, were driven by um, uh, denouncing caste hierarchies, et cetera. And, and sure, it had its materialist elements in, in the land reform in particular, but the first reforms of the first communist government were educational reforms and healthcare reforms, and they didn't get to land reform much later. And what sustained the movement over time, I think is precisely the kind of status identity politics that you talk about. Likewise, European social democracy was never that redistributive, um, and it certainly never challenged property. I mean, there was a period, sure, where parts of we got nationalized, but for the most part, it was about expanding cases and expanding access to welfare, social protection, and education. So I'm just not really convinced that that distinction is as you make it. I will stop there because we, we are really short on time. Um, there are many, many questions in the comment section. We're also going to open up um, the, the, um, uh, the possibility of people to intervene directly. So um, Grace, have people, I can't quite see the chat column myself, or have people raised their hands? And if so, who should we call? So I see Ashu's raising his hand. So for those of you who don't know, Ashutosh Varsh, the director, the Center for Contemporary South Asia here at Watson. Uh, Ashu, you have a question for our authors and analysts. Grace, can you unmute Ashu? Uh, you're muted, Ashu. I have you as a co-host, so you should be able to unmute. And I've also asked you to unmute, but I can't physically unmute you. Uh, yeah. Can Ashu, you, you're, hear me? Uh, you are- Can you hear me? Okay. 
Um, I have several several comments which I'll send to Kalai later, but the quest the the question about replicability um, of this model is something that I would spend just a couple of minutes on because I think we have we are running out of time. So if you think of whether this model can travel to North India, the real problem is going to be, uh, even theoretically speaking, just the demographic distribution. Brahmins were never more than three to 5% of Southern India. Brahmins are 12% of UP, 12% of Bihar. And if you add to that, the two other upper caste, Kshatriyas and, and, uh, and uh, Vaishyas, that it's a 20% block in, 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 in UP and 18% or so in Bihar. And I can do the numbers for Rajasthan and, and Madhya Pradesh also for you, but let's put that aside for a moment. When the elite you have identified as an adversary slash enemy is only two to 3% of the population, then the democratic political mobilization and creation of hegemony will take a very different form. The, it's not that Malayam Singh Yadav and, and uh, his SP and the Mayavati's BSP were not powerful at, at certain points. They said at certain points were powerful. They couldn't create a hegemonic bloc. There were several reasons. One reason was that the upper class was so numerous in UP and also in, in Bihar. Uh, that's why I think the, the very, uh, the, the, the share of population, the Brahmin share of the population of Tamil Nadu would be a very important determinant of what ultimately happened, um, not the only one. Um, and, and in UP and Bihar, this simply cannot work because isolating some uh, one fifth of the population as your adversary or enemy is going to be an extremely hard political project. Thank you, Ashu. So uh, it, since we are really short on time and we've had a series of uh, fantastic comments and questions from the panelists and now this question from Ashu, I, I wanna invite um, Kalai and Baskar to take a few minutes to respond and then we'll open it up again. At that point, we'll be at 11.30 um, and so I, I want to respect, uh, you know, everyone's time and especially the panelists. And, and so we'll, we'll, we'll formally end at 1130, but we'll, we'll keep the conversation going for those who want to stay on. So uh, Kalai and Baskar, would you like to take a very few minutes uh, to respond? We'll pause at 1130 and then uh, carry on as best we can. Uh, do you want to go first or? Yeah, just a brief, uh, I just, I'll be very brief. Um, uh, yeah, it's a, thank you so much for the uh, very critical and uh, very insightful commands and very critical, of course. Um, and it's a huge list of commands. Wish that uh, we could have you know, presented this much before the, you know, when we could have been able to incorporate many of the things. And two, Commands that I try to address in this, which summarizing largely uh, from uh, uh, from Rina's and uh, Pato's large extent, some extent from uh, <clears throat> Barbara as well. One is uh, with respect to uh, the question of uh, replicability and the model. I think we did a uh, we, our idea of uh, keeping this model not much in the sense of uh, replication as it shows us as you know can be replicated in other state, much or maybe the other region. There is a certain trajectory or the, the certain intervention that is done, which can be learned from the other context. That's our idea, one. Second, to show uh, uh, how different variable, different component interact to build a aggregate whole of the trajectory in the state. That's the idea we, we were having, thinking of uh, having this uh, model. But one intervention we can certainly say, I mean, which can think of replication, which is uh, when you have a, a context where you don't have a a large working class vanguard possible, you know, given the organized sector, you know, huge unorganized sector, one. Second, very heterogeneous population in terms of different, you know, hierarchical relations one with the other. To build a connection among this, maybe, you know, you need a certain different level of political labor. Here, there's something happen in that context. 
it is not to say to undermine the other forms of mobilization definitely if you look at uh, as rina's uh, work shows clearly if you look at the informal labor it is sheerly informal labor collective which has been pushing for welfare food for last 30 years it's beginning from late 70s and 80s onwards and definitely this pressure from the below contributed what the informal labor achieved in the domain of uh, welfare board and the welfare outside the labor outside the work site even if you take i mean i did a field work among the uh, 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 the unions in the organized sector if you talk to them they'll say why i, I mean if, because if we if look at the broad indicators the wage rate wage share is high and the less contracts relationship in the state and one level you see this and another level you see the clear uh, sort of indifference from the parties say dmk or admk towards the workers then when we ask them how it's possible you know you can you know both you negotiate one level you don't you don't support you know you don't see the dmk or admk coming forward in support of workers other side you see the better outcome in your own uh, indicators you know work condition others they say which is which is we actually able to mobilize with the local council and other issues any work any issue happens with the worker in sense put it this simple terms some way the workers or the union are able to negotiate with the capital better in the state because of its location or maybe it's it will integrated with the civil society in in its location i think that could be so therefore it is not definitely a top down uh, intervention that took place which actually resulted in the positive or the outcome that we see it's definitely a push from the below and also it's well recorded even if you look at the interventions in pds for instance when in 90 late 90s the pds was actually targeted there was huge mobilization against the targeting pds therefore obviously the state had to withdraw that targeting which is imposed by the center the targeting pds in the sense targeting intervention so somebody what we are saying is it's not definitely a top down populist from the elite elite and elite from the political class definitely it is the what the outcome we show here is shaped by the interaction of these two that's a thing and the model replication as we i mean reiterate is when you do not have a one single dominant group which can vanguard you know as a working class which we see in the other context social democratic you know politics in the europe we don't have that context in india you have a diverse population different identities so to bring them together you have a what we i mean using this populist frame to build this block and to argue and you know claim for certain intervention that's our understanding of replication it could be obviously it's uh, it's cultural politics it's structural context doesn't allow replication even within india as uh, uh, ashwin mentioned yeah thank you <clears throat> okay yeah so can i come in patrick okay yeah yeah i'll yeah. just make yeah uh, maybe respond to three uh, comments you know which i think i mean uh, are particularly important and again thank you all for having you know taken so much time to uh, reflect on and uh, look at you know uh, what we have done uh this one is again uh, just to follow up on what tale had to say about this replicability of the model i think pro- probably a clarification is in order uh when when we we are definitely not saying it is replicable in the sense that you know you identify uh, uh you know a brahmin elite and against which you all come together and that can you know kind of travel i think uh, uh what we are trying to essentially say is uh, as kale said but by building is a set of equivalences across disparate groups which may have antagonistic relations within them yeah and by building a sense of solidarity across them through this identity we are able to build a mass block and this block this i mean if you look at some of the literature derived in movement they explicitly say they do refer to them as laborers yeah and they do say they do say that they are lower caste laborers and there are several instances where there is idea of a productive caste being kind of exploited by a rontier caste elite you know so that's the kind of a narrative you know that's constantly consistently being built it is not so much about caste solidarities but the fact that a large number of people are uh, kind of confined to the position of laboring and not act- actually having dignity you know it's in that sense you know the solidarities were being built that is one and second 
when you talk about uh, uh, mobility, uh, this replicability, what actually we are trying to suggest, especially if you go by what MOVE is trying to kind of suggest, uh, this populist project is not so much about kind of you know capturing power, but much more important is this idea of building a collective subject, you know, a people which can then act to expand the domain of substantive democracy. I think the political project's emphasis is building on the collective subject much more than actually capturing a, a, a political power. The argument is that once you create that subject through political labor, then the, what is possible the, in terms of extending the domain of sub, uh, substantive democracy is much, much more kind of open-ended than you know, what would be possible otherwise. So it is in that sense, uh, we think that you know, this is kind of replicable, especially in societies where the strict uh, divide between capital and labor has not kind of evolved. Uh, yeah, and then this uh, thing about power, uh, this another important thing which we'd like to kind of hi highlight here is when this conception of power by the movement uh, and what makes it uh, different from the left uh, mobilization is that it's not that they did not recognize power emanating from economic structure. Clearly, uh, as in fact, even when I read out this idea that some are born capitalists and some are born laborers, essentially uh, identifies where the source of power is primarily located in caste society in India. Yeah. So once you have that kind of an imagination, and if you also look at the kind of terrain under which they're operating, you have the colonial administration stepping up, you have a new elite, you know, within the bureaucracy emerging. And interestingly, you, you find the reason why a small section of the landed elites also identified with the Dravidian movement is that you find a certain uh, section of the landed elites, the Brahmins, were able to make the trajectory from land-based power to modern forms of power, which was much more kind of, you know, uh, uh, which was much more dominating than merely land-based power. And, and this uh, thing that land with this possibility that under modernizing logic, land-based power may not kind of hold out in the long run. That is, you know, I think that reading is particularly useful to understand how political mobilization played out in Tamil Nadu. So it's not that land was not, uh, the land-based power was not important or property-based relationships was not important. We have kind of identified how land reforms through a series of molecular, molecular interventions were made possible in Tamil Nadu and tenancy has virtually disappeared in the state. But the source of, power was located much more in this expanding domain of modern sphere, particularly in the administration, in the bureaucracy, and in the entering into upper segment of the labor market, which is much more hegemonic for able to control the domain of uh, the uh, cultural sphere uh, uh, where the emphasis was on. Yeah, I think I'll probably stop here and then I'll take, we can take more questions. Thank you. So I, I don't see any raised hands um, and Kalai and Buskar, I, you have access to the comments, right? I, I, imag I imagine you've seen the comments. So if there's any in particular that you'd like to respond to, but I just wanna quickly invite Parto or um, Rina, and I think Barbara has left us. If, if, there, if there's anything you'd like to have heard um, in, in Kalai and Buskar's response that you would like to respond to. Well, not really. I mean, uh, in, in some ways, I, th I, th I think the, um, you know, some of the crucial points that have been raised, particularly in relation, you see the replicability question, I think, I think the final answer was uh, quite appropriate that the, you know, the argument cannot be that the same kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the particular way in which the sort of internal border was drawn in, in, in Tamil society, you know, between on the, on the lines of caste, right? Uh, Brahmins as the, as the uh, enemy and everybody else as the true people. That's not something that will necessarily be replicable everywhere. But the interesting problem, I think that uh, the question that is being raised by, uh, by uh, Bhaskar and, and, and Kalai uh, is whether or not something a foundation, a cultural foundation in a movement can be found, uh, which is populist in the sense which identifies a certain uh, elite 
as being the impediment, the principal impediment to uh, greater prosperity uh, of the people, whether that might be an appropriate foundation for a developmental strategy in a particular state or region. And I think that's the interesting kind of question. So um, clearly specific, it could be language. Uh, it, you know, there are very interesting things you could say about Assam, for instance. Uh, you know, what is the foundation of, of, of what is often being called, you know, ethnic uh, sub-nationalism in, in Assam. So there could be a whole range of things that might happen. But that is the interesting kind of question that's being raised. Uh, on the question of the internal divisions, and that I think is, is something that they really need to uh, flesh out a little more, because in a sense, the question has been sidestepped in, in, in this particular book. Uh, you know, what, what is the significance of the divisions uh, within the Dravidian movement? Because the Dravidian movement, in the way it began and in the way it, it emerged, even in, 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 the, in the 1960s, uh, the kind of solidarities that one saw in the anti-Hindi agitation, for instance, uh, that sort of solidarity has clearly diminished and you might say even fragmented. And I think that is an important kind of question, uh, which which hasn't been uh, addressed. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Martha. Uh, Rina, you're raising your hand. Yeah, well, I, I also think the, the answer to the uh, replicability um, question was really appropriate. But I do still come back to this ish question of, so one thing I, I think it came up again in the discussion was that um, in addition to being a caste movement, it was also an ethnic movement. And so I completely agree with you that it's we're not you're not saying that, oh, you have to be dr replicate Dravidianism and anti Brahminism and you have to have 3%. You just have to find whatever the 3% minority of elites is. It's a constructed identity and create it and somehow um, unite the 97% around some kind of identity. Of course, that means getting rid of some 3%. But that can be used by both sides of the spectrum, right? And so how are we going to decide whether it's going to, we're going to replicate it if it goes to left populism, but stop it in its track if it goes to right populism. And it's not clear how one would do that. So I, I still come back to this question of, you know, which aspect of it, I agree with you that status-based identity movements is, is effective and obviously necessary. I agree with Patrick, it's, of course, it's intertwined with class, but when we start getting into this kind of um, modeling on ethnic-based or some kind of status-based solidarity movement of a 97%, whatever that 97% constitutes, um, uh, there has to be some way for us to distinguish when it's a good <laughs> populism or a bad one. And frankly, we see the results of this of a similar type of populism obviously emerging on the right. Uh, yeah. Which uh, raises the really interesting question, which is one of the questions that's been posed in the uh, chat section of the relationship between a Dravidian left populism and the ethno-nationalist uh, populism of the BJP, uh, what I call retrenchment populism. And again, the parallel with Brazil is really striking. So on the one hand, the PT constructed a very broad uh, left Lulaism populism uh, that was very much focused on social rights and horizontal solidarities across very disparate groups aimed against the old very white propertied elites. And in very in the course of a single election, the logic of populism has been completely flipped, um, which I, I think underscores the fact of just how fragile all populisms are. Um, and here in the United States, we still haven't figured out whether we, we're still stuck in the Trumpist populist uh, regime, he, he, he thinks we're, we, we've got him for another four years, apparently, given his speech last night. Um, or whether we're shifting to a new, um, you know, multiculturalist left populism, right? So um, maybe with that last question in mind, I, I could ask uh, uh, Kalai and Buskar 
to, to briefly comment again, and then we should bring um, these, these matters to an end. Uh, we're already a, a good 10 minutes past our, our, our official uh, end point. Uh, Kalai or Baskar? Uh, yeah, briefly. Yeah, uh, it's but the, the, I just like to address the internal uh, uh, internal contradiction to the Dravidian block. Actually, one second, the ability to withstand or ability to have uh, sustain this cultural base for that you know of, of this historical block. So definitely, if you look at the recent, let me mention in the clearly in our conclusion chapter, there's a clear fragmentation within the block which is there is unevenness of the caste groups in terms of uh, uh, disparities and also the new uh, tension that has emerged in the recent time, particularly the, uh, from the caste that is uh, particularly for Dalits and the intermediate caste. This is definitely a, a, a very, very strong uh, obstacle or any way of sustaining this block. No doubt, absolutely no doubt. And the second important, this another challenge that is also happening is different kind of ethno nationalism that is emerging which is which is some way uh, rejecting this dravidian block in the sense the ethno nationalism which is we call as tamil nationalism which is which which considers to be an authentic tamil against the dravidian which is not authentic enough so there is also a cultural uh, uh, base of the dravidian movement of loosening in that sense so we are not sure of the given this context whether the, the future of this block or sustainability, but what sustains so far delivering the outcome that we see, developmental outcome, will, is because of the, the, the kind of uh, uh, narrative that we build based on the uh, based on the Dravidian identity and uh, the original solidarity. So whether it has a future, it's it's definitely is uh, it's under question. Yeah, I completely agree with uh, Pato on this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, Yeah, quickly. Yeah. On the internal divisions, uh, this was what I would like to we just took an interesting thing. I'm a bit more positive than Kalai on this. Uh, if you look at uh, the major party, which is opposing the Dravidian uh, kind of uh, you know movement or the parties, is the Patali Makal Karchi, is the PMK, which is essentially a most backward caste party. And uh, the most prominent Dalit party, which is the VCK, is uh, you know closely aligned with the uh, not only aligned with the DMK, but has been consistently making a vocal uh, you know uh, campaign on the basis of Dravidian ideology. So, but however, they don't come together. You know, so this is the complex terrain on which uh, you know uh, solidarities. And it's not that these uh, things never existed in the past. Clearly, yes, one, one, one wants to look at rural land relations relationship between the backward caste, land owning uh, caste, and the Dalit laborers, things were antagonistic. However, over a period of time, some of these antagonisms could be muted, one, and then second through interventions, it, uh, the hierarchy, the extent of hierarchy could also be undermined. You know, that is what we were trying to highlight. And, and the question, uh, Rina, on this flipping from right to left and left to right, I think it's true of all, kinds of mobilizations, isn't it? Take social democratic mobilizations, it can't uh, move to the right. I mean, I think it is just a question of political labor and uh, to expect to read off the base and then imagine that only one like uh, kind of, uh, you know, left or right uh, uh, mobilization is likely to happen. I don't think at least historical experiment doesn't allow us to take that. So it basically calls for hard political labor recognition of this differences at the same time trying to imagine. Uh, I think the key thing is to imagine substantive democracy. I think uh, and not dismiss the liberal democratic framework, but use that to kind of expand the notion of uh, what democracy can be. I mean, that's the way I would say. And uh, yeah, nothing is given. That's the way I would say it. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. I think we should be bring these proceedings to an end. Um, let me begin by thanking Kalim Baskar. It's, it's an extraordinary book. It's a, a seminal contribution. It's obviously not just about uh, Tamil Nadu and the Dravidian model. It's about, as we've heard in the comments and in, in your reflections, uh, very big, important, uh, urgent questions of political economy and social justice and, and societal transformation. So th thank you for giving us this book and to everyone who hasn't had a chance to read it yet. Um, I hope it's out soon uh, and that everyone will, will read it carefully.
Uh, I want to thank Barbara, I want to thank Parta, and I want to thank Rina for your extraordinary set of comments. It's, it's it, one of the wonders of Zoom is we record everything. So Kalai and um, Buskar now have a, a full recording of all your comments. Um, and I want to thank everyone who's participated. And I just want to remind everyone that, you know, Zoom technology is extraordinary, but for an event like this to actually happen, you need real labor. Um, and I want to thank Grace Cardongo, who's been with us um, for, for managing uh, this session and organizing it. And I want to also uh, thank Stephanie abbott Pondi, who's um, um, organized, helped organize this event as well. And finally, Ash Ashutosh Varshni, who we heard from uh, earlier, the director of the center. Uh, thank you all. It's been uh, truly a privilege. Please stay safe um, and, and hopefully in the near future we'll have other events like this one where we can see each other once again. So thank you everyone.